Our study of the David stories continues in the 17th chapter of the second book of Samuel. And David and the people that were with him were hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. On a single day between dawn and dark, David was catapulted from the throne in Jerusalem into the wilderness on the far side of the Jordan. He did not plan on making that journey. This was not a vacation trip to see the scenic sights of the wild. Suddenly, in a strange chain of events, David was stripped of his kingly crown the trappings of royalty, and all the perquisites of life in a palace. And David's men, who had expanded his old borders from Egypt to the great Euphrates River, they're all there with David, back in the wilderness. Now that was a spectacular fall, but oddly enough, they're all back exactly where they started long ago. Back then, David and these guys did not choose to spend 10 years of their lives in the wilderness. They were chased into the wilderness as fugitives from the law with a price on their head. They were running for their lives from King Saul, from the bounty hunters, from the Philistine raiding parties into the wilderness of Paran, into the caves of Angedi, into the desert outpost of Ziklag. Day by day, hand to mouth, living on the razor's edge of danger. Have you ever noticed how many wilderness stories there are in the Bible? There are 15 of them from the life of David himself. There's the 40-year journey of Moses through the wilderness, and Elijah in the wilderness, and John the Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, and Jesus, 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of testing. It's not a geographical spot on any map. It's a place on the spiritual journey of anybody who follows in David's steps or Jesus' steps. If you're going to have anything at all to do with God, you're going to spend some time in the wilderness. That's why it's important to get a feel for the wilderness. How dangerous it can be. How beautiful it can be. And it can happen to us with the same sudden unexpectedness. You graduate from school with all kinds of high hopes and grandiose plans. And then the letdown comes. You find yourself drifting aimlessly, wandering from one barren thing to the next. Nothing to tie to. Nothing to absorb one's life. Or it can happen on the other end of the spectrum. After all the years of struggle, raising the kids, making the house payments, laying aside a little nest egg, thinking that retirement is going to be a time when you've got it made. And then something goes wrong. Sometimes it's our fault, sometimes not. An axle breaks in the machinery of life. Illness comes. An accident. A loved one dies. Or the loved one makes your life miserable. A dark spot shows up on the x-ray. The financial investments go sour. Whoa! We're not in control anymore. And we're back in the wilderness. Looking back on it, 
the ten years David and his men spent in the wilderness were the best years of their lives. They learned things about themselves, about each other, and about God. They could not have learned any other way. They kept running to God because they didn't have any place else to run to. And they kept finding in God a shelter from the storm, a mighty fortress, a rock of salvation, along with Moses and Elijah and John and Jesus. They drew close to God in the wilderness. They faced the very worst and found the unexpected best. And now, the text tells us, David and the people who were with him were hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. The question is, can God do for you what he once did? They left Jerusalem in a hurry that day with only what they could carry the fighting men with their weapons, the women with the children, and very little else. Old Hushai, David's friend, stayed behind. He was trying to buy David some time. And he did. He brought down the wisdom of Ahithophel. But the problem was he didn't know it. All he knew was that a strike force of 12,000 men was poised to fall on, fall on David's straggling column. Hushai left that meeting. He went to the priest, say, Dr. Nebuchadnezzar's son gave him a message. The priest gave a message to a young girl with a water pitcher who went out to the well beyond the walls. She relayed the message to two young boys, Jonathan and Ahimaaz, with feet as fleet as deers, and off they went. But Absalom's men spotted the two of them, and a posse chased them down, and they ran into a farmyard. And the woman of the house lowered them into a well, threw a blanket over the top, spread out some grain as though it were lying there to dry. Did you see two young fugitives come this way? Why, yes, I did, she answered. They went uh, closer to the water. Well, which wasn't a lie exactly, because down in the well they were very close, but they assumed that she meant the river, and off they galloped. The two young guys finally get to David's camp, and they tell him the message. This night, cross over at once. And they made the dangerous fording of Jordan in the dark, and by daybreak, they were on the other side, in the wilderness of Maenaim. Now, the wilderness of Maenaim ought to remind you of another Bible story. Centuries earlier, the pilgrim Jacob wandered into the wilderness of Maenaim with a heart that was as desolate as the landscape. He was cheered to see what a crowd of angels were, angels accompanying him. The Bible says that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who shall inherit salvation. And now in May and Nahum, angels show up. Oh, pardon me, angels with skin on show up. And they bring bedding and bowls, and articles of pottery, and wheat, and barley, and flour, and roasted grain, and beans, and lentils, and honey, and curds, and cheese, and sheep. And what a weird assortment of angels they were that brought it. There was show by the Ammonites. The Ammonites were hereditary enemies. Shobai wasn't. And Makir of Lodabar. You may remember him. He's the guy who sheltered the crippled grandson of King Saul. 
Machir was loyal to Saul because Saul was the Lord's anointed, but now Machir is loyal to David because David's the Lord's anointed. And then there's this 80-year-old rancher by the name of Barzillai. He shows him. He should be retired. This ain't his fight. But there he is. And these were not mercenaries. They didn't come to get something out of it. When the chips were down and David's back is against the wall, they said, count me in. Jesus told us that friends are a gift from God to us. And Jesus gave us this reading of friendship. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Friendship, real friends, has more in it of giving than all these organizations you got where you get something. Also, this was going on all over the land. Some people were having second thoughts about the new regime of Absalom. Others never bought into it for a minute. David, well, the older people, I had a young kid, the older ones could remember what they had with King Saul. Ew. And then what God gave them in David. David's faults were obvious, plain for the whole world to see. But David saw them too. David was their shepherd who led them to the green pastures of God's grace and God's mercy. For 3,000 years, people, believers have been reading David's penitential psalms. The liturgy that we went through moments ago is from those psalms. So, in Jerusalem, on a side street, in a bakery, a man puts a gone fishing sign in the window, <clears throat> bolts the door, digs around in the storeroom out back till he finds his old sword, and marches off down the dusty road to find David's camp. Up in Galilee, a farmer's plowing the field, and he's thinking about this all day, and finally, he leaves the plow in the field, brings the oxen home, takes his spear, dented shield down off the mantle, kisses his wife and the kids goodbye, and walks off to fight at David's side once more. Now, they're not as young as they used to be, but they were veterans of hand-to-hand -hand combat. And... They were not afraid. And you're thinking, well, this isn't much of an army. Well, they believed in the Lord. And in the Lord's anointed. And I know that doesn't look like anything to you. But a common faith that binds hearts together our ties so strong, no sword can sever them. No fire of persecution can fray them. No our tension can ever tear them apart. It's all been tried. Now, David and his men are back where they started. In May and Nahum, David isn't the king anymore. In May and Nahum, his soldiers are not the honor guard of Israel anymore. They're just sheep of the Lord's pasture. And they're praying again. The Lord is my shepherd. They're praying again. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no. They're praying again. Prepare, O Lord, a table before me in the presence of my enemy. We always end up exactly where we started out. They're all agreed on that, by the way. 
they chime in with the prophet Job. Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked shall I depart. God supported us, and we depended on it to guard our infant heads when we were small. And at the end, when we leave all of the comforts and the securities and the treasures of this, and we are going to leave them, then it will not be the first time that God has carried us and shielded us and supported us and saved us. Amen.